homage to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. A request has been made to give some short instructions for the Deveda Vitaka Sutta. So when we went through our session, what we were really doing is developing the Noble Eightfold Path. All the meditations that we do in terms of Sutta meditations, they give an insight pathway that helps us to develop the Noble Eightfold Path. And that Noble Eightfold Path becomes the Tenfold Path. That's very apparent when you look at the Deveda Vitaka Sutta. And the instructions will show how we begin with right view and how we end up developing right concentration. And of course, in the Deveda Vitaka Sutta, you end up also with right knowledge and right liberation, because this is the pathway that the unenlightened Bodhisattva took to then become the Buddha. What we're really doing is training in the higher trainings. So sila, samadhi, panya. So we often talk about the training in higher virtue, adisila sika. We also talk about the training in the higher mind or the higher concentration of mind, adichitta sika. And then also training in the higher wisdom, adipanya sika. When we develop the Noble Eightfold Path, we are training in higher virtue. So this is through body, speech and mind. And when it comes to training in higher concentration, we are enabling ourselves to be secluded from sensual pleasures and unwholesome states in order to then enter into the jhanas. That gives us the strength and power in order to realize the higher wisdom. So the mind becomes one-pointed, unified, nothing can disturb it in order to penetrate the arising and passing away phenomena, in order to penetrate the Four Noble Truths, and to really understand as it really is. What is the distinction between being bound to samsara, greedy ignorance and craving, versus leaning and inclining towards nibbana, the complete cessation of all suffering, the complete cessation of all tanha, or craving, and being able to destroy the taints, the bonds, the floods, the fetters, all these different things. So when we do this meditation on the Tibeta Vitaka Sutta, we have a very strong intention to follow in the footsteps of the Buddha, to follow in the footsteps of the noble arahants who have also realized the truth. The way we start the meditation is to be very clear in our minds that there are two buckets of thoughts. There are kusala thoughts or skilled thoughts and there are akusala thoughts, unskilled thoughts. When we do this and we're very clear that there are two distinct classes or buckets of thoughts, we are establishing right view. If you remember from the Samaditi Sutta, this is one of the ways to establish right view, knowing kusala from akusala, wholesome from unwholesome. So we know that thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, thoughts of cruelty or harm, these fall into the class that is akusala, unskillful, unwholesome. And so they are rooted in greed, hatred and delusion. Likewise, when we take thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of non-ill will or goodwill, thoughts of non-cruelty or non-harm, rooted in non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion, this is establishing our right view. So in the meditation, the next thing you do, having established the right view, you'll cast your mind through thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will and thoughts of non-cruelty. And you ask yourself, is there anything in the mind that I'm still grasping onto that is imbued with this because it's rooted in greed, hatred and delusion? It's important to take a very good example that is definitely troubling us. And the thing about thoughts to really, really see, whether it's thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will or thoughts of cruelty or harm, all these thoughts, when we look at it, they lead on to unwholesome speech and unwholesome action. So the fact that we are dealing with the thoughts right now means we are looking to cut off further unwholesome behavior. So sensual thoughts are really ones around wanting, craving, some material object, whether it's a person or a thing. And it's important to really see the danger of these things. It's what suppresses the mind from entering into a concentration that is more powerful, more strong, more unified. If our mind is constantly whirling around sensuality, then it's very difficult, very big block. 
likewise with ill will. Normally the one with ill will is someone is harming me or someone has harmed me in the past or someone is going to harm me. And that also applies to loved ones that someone has harmed my loved ones, someone is harming my loved ones and someone will harm my loved ones. The mind gets consumed with that. It could be somebody at work, it could be somebody who's a relative, it could be a friend, or it could be someone we don't like. It's important to recognize the texture of ill will in the mind. Something we don't want to let go of. And then when it comes to thoughts of cruelty, they're rooted in delusion. And often we're evaluating this is better than that. When it comes to strong views, they're norm normally rooted in delusion. And so the topics that come up are often quite unbeneficial topics. Views and opinions about the world, the economy, about many different things happening at work, many different things happening at home, many different things associated with doing aspects, even in a monastery. Always evaluating, always raising one thing and lowering another, forgetting about Nibbana. So you take whatever those thoughts are in sensual desire, ill will and cruelty and you use this teaching that has been given. You reflect, this thought has arisen in me, this leads to my own affliction, to others' affliction and to the affliction of both. It obstructs wisdom, it causes difficulty and it leads away from Nibbana. So the really important thing is to really see that that is what is happening. It can be at the very mundane level where there is literally you're harming yourself because these thoughts are really troubling and you keep immersed in these particular unwholesome thoughts. So you know it's bad because it's unwholesome. It's subduing the mind from entering into something more wholesome. You're caught or latched onto a person or a thing or an idea that is blocking the path, the noble path. And when it comes to other people, if we have ill will or cruelty thoughts towards a particular person, then you know it is harmful to another person. In terms of sensual desire, sometimes that's harder to see, but it's also associated with giving the wrong example to others. So if we're on the Buddha's path, we don't want to hinder anybody else's path by giving this wrong example about sensual pleasures. This path is about renunciation, but if we show that it is about sensual pleasures and indulging in sensual pleasures, then other people follow that wrong example and they also decline on the path. So that's another way of looking at it. But when it comes to the bigger picture, what we know is that sensual desire, those thoughts, thoughts of ill will, thoughts of cruelty, they're rooted in greed, hatred and delusion. So they lead us away from Nibbana and so we are bound to samsara. The more we cultivate these thoughts, they grow. When they grow, we are further away from liberation. We are still bound very much to suffering. So that's another way of seeing it. And in particular with sensual desire, to really understand that a lot of things happen with physical nutriment. If we keep latching on to sensual things, then we end up burning with lust. When we end up burning with lust and with the misapprehension, not seeing the danger in sensual pleasures, we are joined to coming back again. Whatever pain or suffering we experience in this lifetime, it could be more in the next rebirth. And we never cut off rebirth if we keep going with sensual pleasures, sensual desire. And of course, anything we take in that way, we will always end up with ill will. Birthing this body means that there is inherently ill will because we are subject to aging, sickness and death and we continue to be deluded and so it's all linked in that way. If you contemplate that it obstructs wisdom, always reflect that this is the wisdom path. If you take the simile of the deer herd, Buddha is showing us the noble path, the way out of suffering, but if we keep Falling for the baits of samsara, the world, what Mara is showing us is to take delight in the next thing and the next thing, to distract ourselves, to keep getting imbued in the world as a way out of suffering. We know deep down that that's not the answer. We know that there are only ups and downs when it comes to those kinds of pleasures. 
we end up back in a well, back in harmful thoughts. When you take that simile of the deer herd, the Buddha is pointing out the noble path, saying, come away from that. That blocks wisdom. It's not helpful. You stay baited to the world, bonded to the world. The right path is the one that renunciates that. And so that's how you look at it, obstructing wisdom. You don't want the wisdom path to be cut off. You don't want to fall for the dummy or the decoy. So the dummy is the delight and lust in the next thing and the next thing. And the ignorance is the decoy where we still get caught up in the hindrances, sensual desire, ill will, restlessness and worry, sloth and torpor and doubt. And so we say we don't want to fall for that. If these thoughts are the ones that are obstructing wisdom, let me give them up. Let's not have these troubles in the mind. So you know when the mind is troubled, the mind keeps circling around the unskilled thoughts, the unwholesome thoughts. So we are led away from Nibbana, knowingly or unknowingly. But in our meditation, we are knowingly being led away. So if we make a very strong determination, let me give up whatever these central thoughts are, Whatever these ill will thoughts are, whatever these cruelty thoughts are, then what happens is we've given up greed, hatred and delusion. We haven't cut off the noble eightfold path. We are giving up the wrong eightfold path. If it's very, very difficult, if the mind won't let go, also think about we are belittling Nibbana. When we do that, we are saying what is in the world is higher, greater, better than Nibbana. Even if we experience peaks, they're very fleeting. If we start contemplating ill will or harmful thoughts, they grow. So we belittle Nibbana when we indulge and enjoy those kinds of thoughts. So if you have a lot of sadda, a lot of conviction towards the Buddha and the Buddha Dhamma, you immediately want to let that go. If you let go of unskilled thoughts, you're letting go of the wrong path and you're letting go of this belittling of Nibbana. What arises in the mind is skilled thoughts, thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of non-ill will, thoughts of non-harm or non-cruelty. So what arises, what is now coming up is non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion. So that means we're inclining towards Noble Eightfold Path. And we have respect for Buddha Dhamma and Buddha's enlightenment and the Buddha himself and the noble Arahants. So you develop the meditation that way. You take as long as needed to actually see that. As long as you need for sensual thoughts, as long as you need for ill will thoughts, as long as you need for cruelty thoughts. Use that instruction from the Buddha, seeing each one It leads to my own affliction, it leads to the affliction of others, and it leads to the affliction of both. It is blocking wisdom. It's creating trouble in the mind, and I'm far away from Nibbana. The minute you see it, these other thoughts come up. Thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of non-ill will, thoughts of non-cruelty, and you start following the good path, the right path. If we have correctly contemplated in the meditation, then this right intention that has arisen by looking at thoughts, it fixes onto right view. It fully recognizes the distinction between the two classes of thoughts, kusala, akusala, skilled, unskilled, wholesome, unwholesome. So when we abandon the unskilled thoughts and we are having the skilled thoughts, That becomes our right view. At that moment, there is no misconduct by speech or by our bodily actions because the mind is the forerunner. So you can see that the virtue path factors are being developed. Right speech, right action, right livelihood. Mind leads. So when you cut off those thoughts, you're cutting off the other verbal and bodily actions that are unwholesome, unskilled. At the same time, in this meditation, as we've been developing it, right view about what's skilled and unskilled, we have been making the noble right effort to abandon unskilled thoughts. And it is right mindfulness that keeps coming back and saying, yes, right view is 
the distinction between skilled and unskilled. Abandon the unskilled, develop the skilled. And right effort makes that happen. So we know that they're running and circling around each other. Right view, right effort, right mindfulness. So everything is starting to come together. When this is in place, what you really see in the mind is the texture of the mind is secluded from sensual pleasures. So secluded from any objects, any experiences of the sensual nature. It's secluded also from unwholesome states. We're not thinking about any people in an unwholesome way. We're not thinking about any topics in any unskillful way. They're all discarded from the mind. When you have this seclusion from sensual pleasures, seclusion from unwholesome states, this is now the foundation for right concentration. In the meditation, the way it develops is you do the instructions. This is the Vitaka Vichara. You're thinking and examining about this Dhamma. And all these things are happening as you think and examine with right view. When you do so, you start to see yourself entering jhana. It may feel like the body starts to become very alert, heightened awareness around the body. You start to feel some rapture. The way you skillfully direct the mind is when that rapture that tingles around the body, the tingles around the head, whichever way it comes, the mind feels that entry into happiness, heightened alertness, that little bit of rapture and pleasure. You build on that because at some point, you know, let me let go of the thinking and examining of this Dhamma. I don't need it anymore. I don't need to be thinking about thoughts because I'm actually secluded now from thoughts and defilements and hindrances. There is concentration in the mind. And it's a very subtle thing. So in the early days when you're not skilled at jhanas, you're not sure, but you just train anyway. You just follow the instruction. When you're more skilled, you know you have enough momentum in order to let go of thinking and examining. And when you let go of the thinking and examining, what you're going with is the rapture, like you feel it coursing through the body. The mind is feeling very, very rapturous. So that's the second jhana. Usually what's really helpful is to spend some time in each of the jhanas. So the first one, you get familiar with it. And if you consciously let go of the thinking and examining because you know you're in the jhana, then you go immediately to the second jhana and it feels so blissful. When it feels so blissful and rapturous, spend some time in the second jhana because what you're enjoying is a happiness that is greater, much, much greater than pleasures of sensuality. You start to see the nature of joy and rapture of renunciation versus joy and rapture of sensual pleasures. When you start to get tired out, and it does happen, you actually do notice that the blissful state does get tiring. So when that feels like it's coming, then what you do is you let go of the rapture and in a way have an intention that says in your mind, let me go to something a little more settled. So you let go of the rapture and what you're left with is pleasure. So the body feels more settled, the concentration deepens, but there is still this immense pleasure in the mind. Third jhana, you allow yourself to feel this somewhat steadier concentration and happiness. It's more subtle than second jhana. And so you allow yourself to remain in third jhana for a while. At some point you realize, I need to let go of this pleasure because with pleasure comes pain, it's automatic. So in order to sustain the concentration and deepen it, what you realize even from what we've learned before is that equanimity is the highest state of concentration. You want to go beyond the feeling of pain and pleasure. And so that's what you direct yourself to for the fourth jhana. And so with equanimity, what you're really saying is that this feeling of neither painful nor pleasure is something that is far more steady. And so what you realize there is something that is much more still. What gets really refined at this point is you're letting go of in-breath and out-breath. 
it's what results. And so all that's left is quietness. And you genuinely feel that the concentration is much deeper. It's very apparent that it's very stable, steady. A concentration that is different from the others because you know that nothing can really distract you. And so it's very good to spend time in the fourth jhana for as long as possible. Be friends with these jhanas. So in your meditation, when it's very firm and steady, you can do these contemplations around the three knowledges. So the first one is around past births. The second one is around seeing the passing away and reappearance of beings. And the third is often the one where you contemplate the Four Noble Truths or the arising and passing away as well. The purpose of this meditation is really to practice. Gradual practice, gradual training, gradual progress. You keep doing this meditation in order to see what the Buddha saw. You do this meditation in order to develop the path factors and to know how to develop right concentration, noble right concentration, whenever you want it, without trouble or difficulty. And you reap all the benefits of that. In that way, you see, this is the path that the Tathagata is showing us. This is the one that leans and inclines towards Nibbana. And you see, when you attain the noble right concentration, you are very far away from the wrong path, the wrong eightfold path, ignorance. You're away from all the unskillful things that block the path. And so you haven't fallen for any of it. And you are inclining and progressing on the right path. We can end our session here. Let's share the merit with all sentient beings. May all beings be happy and well. May all beings be free from suffering. Blessings of the Triple Gem. Wishing you all well. Peruan Saranai.